there's increasing evidence that the stronger medications for MS are better despite the potential side effects. But do you have to take them forever or once the disease is under control, can you de-escalate to a more conservative approach? Today, we'll look at the scientific evidence behind this strategy of MS disease modifying therapy, de-escalation. Remember what Hippocrates said, first, do no harm. So more and more people, including young people with relapsing MS with a low amount of current disability are taking stronger medicines, which may sound counterintuitive, but it makes sense because the whole point of these treatments is to prevent disability, and there's more and more evidence for it. For instance, this is an observational study from Southeast Wales of 592 people who either did the standard escalation therapy, that's the blue line where they started with a more conservative agent and only changed to a stronger medication if they had an attack or a new lesion, versus early intensive therapy, the yellow line, people who just started with the stronger medications up front. This is not a randomized controlled trial, but they did adjust for some confounders that correlated with prognosis, and they looked for disability progression. So it starts off at 100%, did not reach sustained accumulation of disability, and as time went on, more and more people developed accumulation of disability, but people in the yellow line getting early intensive therapy did a little bit better. Now, this is not 10 years of a strong drug versus 10 years of a weak drug, people with escalation therapy could change to a stronger medication if something happened, so that's why there's not a huge difference. But you can see there is some difference there based on this initial strategy. This study looks at two countries, Sweden and Denmark, with very similar demographics, but different strategies in treating multiple sclerosis. In Sweden, they're more aggressive. They use a lot of rituximab, which is a B-cell depleting drug, similar to Ocrevus, Casimta, and Brie which is strong and effective in multiple sclerosis, but is an immunosuppressant and has a risk of infections. Whereas in Denmark, they're more conservative using more injectables and oral agents, at least at first, at least at the time of this study. And they looked at confirmed disability progression. Everyone starts off at no progression relative to their baseline. And over time, Sweden, the yellow line, had less progression compared to Denmark, suggesting the more aggressive approach was better. They also looked at risk of reaching EDSS or expanded disability status scale of three. EDSS is a measure of disability in multiple sclerosis research. Three would be mild to moderate disability. And people in Sweden had a 24% lower risk of EDSS three, suggesting that Sweden's more aggressive approach is a little better. By the way, my name is Brandon Bieber. I make videos about MS every Wednesday. So let's say you're convinced that stronger medicines are better. Should you take them forever. Well, this is an observational study from Rocky Mountain MS Center in Colorado, and there's some very prominent names on this paper, such as Drs. John Corboy and Brandy Vollmer, and this is an observational study of 1,246 people with MS, and it looks at their disease activity versus their age. So this is sort of inflammatory disease activity, clinical relapses, and new or active lesions on MRI. Now, of course, there are other forms of activity, such as subtle insidious progression and new multimodal MRI studies suggest there is inflammation even in older people with progressive MS, but a lot of the evidence for disease modifying therapies is on this form of disease activities, relapses and new MRI lesions that are either new or enlarging T2 bright lesions or gadolinium enhancing lesions. And you can see there's a clear decrease in activity with age. Now, anyone who sees patients with MS like me knows this already. It's very obvious relapses and new lesions in untreated with people with MS are very common in younger people and they become less common with age, though people can have slow progression. In fact, I would argue that when you get into the 60s and 70s, even this could overestimate the amount of activity because it could be difficult in order to judge who's having a relapse because any sort of insult to the body and infection, sleep deprivation, electrolyte disturbance can cause a significant worsening of multiple sclerosis symptoms. Nonetheless, the authors are arguing that the benefit of the stronger, more potent disease-modifying therapies may be less significant with age. And of course, as people get older, acquire more medical conditions, they're more likely to get complications, and this could shift the risk-benefit ratio. So from the same data, they looked at the probability of disease activity 
with weaker agents such as pills, Gelenium, and Tecfidera versus stronger infusible agents, Tysabri or Rituximab in blue. Now, Gelenia is not necessarily a weak drug. It's moderately effective. It was actually superior to Avonex in the head-to-head trial, but it's not as strong as these IV agents. And they looked at their disease activity and age. And by the way, the straight lines are the actual data and the dashed lines are the confidence intervals. And you can see they're a little wider in very young and very old people because there aren't a lot of 10-year-olds with multiple sclerosis and there aren't as many 80-year-olds with MS because some of them do pass away. And you can see in younger people, the stronger medicines are clearly superior. But as people get older, they start to converge as disease activity goes down overall. In other words, the oral drugs look pretty good when people are older. Now, you can see they don't completely converge. There may be some modest advantage of Tysabri and Rituximab even in older people, but it's not statistically significant beyond age 54.2. The confidence intervals sort of overlap. It becomes unclear, and the authors argue maybe the additional risk of the stronger drugs isn't warranted in someone who's older or perhaps someone who's stable and hasn't had disease activity for a long time, and de-escalation may be a reasonable approach. So this is what de-escalation might look like. You start with a stronger drug, and throughout the course of the disease, you de-escalate to a weaker and weaker, more conservative drug that's still effective enough without causing too many side effects. And of course, it doesn't make sense to go solely based on age. That's just one factor you could take into consideration. So what does this look like in real life? Well, let's look at some studies. This is a small observational study in people taking Ocrevus who de-escalated to the pill because of fears about the COVID-19 pandemic. So Ocrevus is an infusion medicine similar to rituximab that depletes B cells and is well known to be associated with significant infections in some people who change to the pill Vumeridi, deroximal fumarate, similar to Tecfidera, which I mentioned earlier, which does in fact seem to be safer in terms of risk of severe COVID-19. So they were just concerned because this is when COVID was really bad. It's only 25 people, adults with relapsed MS in a single center, only one year follow-up, but none, zero out of 25, had relapses, and their B cells, labeled CD19, went up from an absolute count of 13 to 151, and they did different assays for their symptoms, their motor skills, verbal function, visual spatial function, and people were about the same after a year, so it seems to be safe to de-escalate from Ocrevus to Vumeridi, at least with a one-year follow-up. Here's a slightly larger study. This was presented at CMSC. I can't find the full publication, but there's several articles about it by Dr. Carolyn Goldschmidt, and she looked at 135 people who switched from stronger agents to either Abagio, a low-efficacy pill for MS, or injectable medications such as Copaxone, Glutyramer acetate, or interferon formulations, and she observed that the relapse rates and MRI activity were comparable to people who continued the higher efficacy medication. Now, they looked at either infusible meds as baseline meds, but they also considered oral meds such as Gelenia to be higher in efficacy. So there wasn't necessarily a huge de-escalation for some of the people in the study, but the fact that they remain stable on these weaker medications that some of us don't have great confidence in is a great sign. Now, another way to do this would be instead of de-escalating from a strong agent to a weaker agent, would be to use a stronger agent less frequently. So what about B cell depleting drugs? like IV formulations usually given every six months, such as Ocrevus, Rituximab, or Briumbi, this author from an opinion article notes that B cell repopulation, the B lymphocytes, the cells that are depleted by these drugs, they repopulate at a medium of 72 weeks, more than a year. And B cell repopulation isn't strongly linked to an increased risk of relapses and new MRI lesions. In other words, if we give the drug and the B cells don't come back for 72 weeks, it's not the half-life of the drug, which is very short, for instance, around three weeks with rituximab, four weeks with Ocrevus, the drug is long gone by six months, but often the B cells are still zero because the bone marrow makes them back 
relatively slowly. And this varies a lot from person to person. Why are we giving these drugs every six months forever if the B cells don't come back for over a year in some people? And also, even when they come back, often people are stable. Perhaps we can give them less often in a stable person who's been on them for a long period. And keep in mind, this is a controversial topic and everyone's situation is different, so please talk to your own provider for personal medical advice. But anyway, this is a study looking at the strategy of giving Ocrevus not every six months, but waiting until the B cells come back. In other words, doing blood tests, and when the B cells start to return, you give the next dose. And of course, you're not doing blood tests every months, so you're always a little behind the eight ball, and you end up giving the drug less often than every six months. And they looked at the outcome of NIDA3, or no evidence of disease activity 3, which means no relapses, no new MRI lesions, and no progression of disability. Everyone starts off at 100% NIDA3 from baseline, and over time, some people have relapses or have new lesions or disability progression, and it's less than 100%. And the standard dosing, the dark line, the every six months dosing, they actually did worse than the extended interval dosing. Also, people getting extended interval dosing, waiting for their B cells to come back, that they had a lower risk of low antibody levels, a side effect of this medication, which can be associated with more infections. So can you wait for the B cells to return prior to getting the next dose of Ocrevus? The answer appears to be yes. Here's a study on Ocrevus in Germany, extended interval dosing, again, giving the drug less often than every six months versus standard dosing, giving it every six months. And they found that extended interval dosing was associated with a similar risk of no evidence of disease activity. You can see that at the bottom of the slide, there are no statistically significant differences. MRI activity was also the same. And B cell repletion, the B limb lymphocytes coming back was not linked to disease activity. Now, before you accuse me of cherry picking, I will show you one study that goes against this. This was a study on Ucrevis in Italy, also during the COVID-19 pandemic. Of course, people worried about getting serious COVID-19 infections, and they found that extended interval dosing was linked to more MRI activity, actually about five times more activity than standard dosing, although the absolute amount was not that high, and there was no difference in disability progression. Now, if you look at this chart of the individual people, the infusions they got, you can see the blue square is MRI activity, and you can see most people actually had some MRI activity, which is unusual, too crazy to believe, in my opinion. How could this many people have newer active lesions on MRI taking a strong strong drug like Ocrevus, even if they were late on the dose. I'm not trying to be bitter just because it refutes my claim, just putting it out there. It's a very strange result in my opinion. What about with rituximab, a drug similar to Ocrevus, also a B-cell depleter? Here they looked at people who were taking 1,000 milligrams every six months who changed to the lower dose, 500 milligrams IV every six months. Now it turns out whether you take 1,000 or 500, you'll likely have zero lymphocytes shortly after the infusion. So do you really need the 1,000 milligrams, particularly if you've been on it for a prolonged period? Well, in this observational study, not a randomized controlled trial, over 12 months, they found that the clinical results were equal, the MRI results were equal, and they looked at neurofilament light chain, a marker of central nervous system damage in the blood shown in this graph, and it was roughly equal. There's a lot of variation in an individual person, but in large groups of people, it does correlate with prognosis a little bit, and there's just no objective evidence in more central nervous system damage in people taking the lower dose, so maybe that's the better dose. Now, we can't necessarily de-escalate anyone, anytime, any place. This is a randomized trial of people trying to go from Tysabri to beta seron. So there were 19 people, 10 randomized to continue Tysabri, and nine randomized to change to beta seron. This is a beta interferon injection every other day, a lower efficacy medicine, and 22%, two out of nine, changing to beta seron, had a relapse versus none, 0% continuing Tysabri, and 75% changing to beta seron had new lesions versus only 37.5% 
continuing Tysabri. This is a very well-known effect. Tysabri or natalizumab, similar to Tyruco, is an immunosequestrant. It traps lymphocytes outside of the central nervous system. And so when you stop the drug, sometimes you can get a rebound effect and actually get worse. This has also been reported with S1P receptor modulators, such as Gelenia. And with these drugs, you have to be more cautious. It's a well-known rebound effect. So to give my personal opinion, I do think de-escalation is a reasonable approach. I'm agnostic as to when we should de-escalate. I think that's a little unclear. Despite the excellent study done at Rocky Mountain MS Center, I probably wouldn't go solely based on age. It's one thing I would take into account, but also the course of the disease, other comorbidities, the risk of the medications in the individual person that we're talking about. I do think de-escalation to less frequent treatment with B cell depleting drugs is reasonable. Despite the one study that goes against it that I showed with the high MRI activity and people taking it less often, Ocrevus, I do think the overall evidence suggests that it's relatively safe with a low risk of relapses and new MRI lesions, though some people do report worsening symptoms if they don't get the drug for a long period of time, which in my opinion is not fully explained, although Many people do report this. Overall, I think if we're going to accept the observational evidence that stronger drugs are better, we should accept the same observational evidence that suggests that they may not be better for everyone. But I'd be interested to know, have you de-escalated from a high-efficacy disease-modifying therapy to a more conservative approach? And why did you de-escalate, and how did it work out for you? And if you are taking a stronger medicine, would you consider de-escalation, and what would convince you to make that? that choice. And let me know if you have ideas for future videos. As usual, citations are below.